friends Damn till the night away, it's like the party never ends Then again, we don't want it to stop Cause tonight's the night, it goes sweat box Laser beam, flashing lights Wild cards, men from Mars, trust in stars and stripes Electric, electric, ladies of the evening Drink a booze and mingle in Mashing to the music, I could do anything Freaky deaky stars, speckles and pink butterflies and Life is nice, so nice I walk into a club and I found paradise I'm seeing stars, I can't believe my eyes I'm seeing stars How's everybody doing? Yeah. Yeah. Almost fell off the stage. <laughs> anyway, I want to say uh, thank you to all you guys for being here and gals for uh, being here tonight. Uh, honestly, I did not expect this many people to be in this room at this particular time. So y'all exceeded, I think, everybody's expectations. Um, you notice we're kind of doing this one a little bit different than the ones we've done in the past. And uh, y'all all heard the stories and the rumors that go along with that and all the good drama. But uh, we're probably going to be doing uh, this sort of fashion from this place some time out. Um, so we wanted to make this more of a community event. And uh, like I said, it's everybody to for everybody to get in. This is the Hard OCP Hardware Workshop sponsored by Yamaha Multimedia. Uh, the fine folks at Yamaha Multimedia uh, pay for all the chairs you're sitting in, and one third of the room. <laughs> and now we're kind of encroaching into AMD space just a little bit. <laughs> and uh, we want to say thanks to the guys at AMD for uh, letting us spill over over there. And uh, yeah. They're going to come up and uh, say a few things to you tonight, but uh, in, in the spirit of, uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, you guys good in the back? No. You guys in the back, is that better? Much better? Okay. Is it like blowing you guys out here in the front? No, it's good. No, it's good? Okay. Um, so in the, the spirit of community and uh, kind of a bunch of hardware guys getting together and talking and shooting the uh, breeze. We uh, decided to ask some of our friends in. So we have Anand, we'll show you with Anand Tech here to talk to you tonight. <laughs> Alex uh, Ross of uh, X Sharky Extreme was going to come in and speak to us, but he's having some family issues, so he has to stay in California tonight, so he will be missed. Yeah. Um, uh, he's always a, 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 a fun joke. But uh, anyway, uh, we've got a lot of sponsors here tonight. Uh, we also have a GeForce FX card running live over here in the corner. That will be there for the entire evening. So uh, after we get finished running our mouths, it's something you can get up and go look at and touch. They also have a card over there that you can, that's out of the machine, that you can actually touch, be able to pick up, look at, do whatever you want to. Don't steal it. <laughs> I, I know you people. <laughs> and yeah, it's dead more. That's the only you can. Yeah, it's cosmetic. Yeah, it's cosmetic. <laughs> yes, it is. Get eight hundred fifty dollars for you know a voodoo five six thousand. Um, all the product you see on this side of us. Uh, came to us via our sponsors. What it took to be a sponsor outside Yamaha Multimedia, paying Pony, they're the only guys that ponied up any cash for this, if you're wondering how this all got put together. Um, so the money for, to pay for all this event comes from Hard OCP and comes from, Hard, and from Yamaha Multimedia, okay? The rest of these guys, yeah, it's my Christmas present to y'all. You'll see the guys, thank you. All right. 
or my Hanukkah gift, or Kwanzaa, or something, just giving stuff away. Uh, you'll see some of the guys running around the cameras. Everything here is being filmed, it is being recorded. And what we are going to do is after we go back and edit out all the places where I screw up and say the F word, <laughs> get that edited out, what we'll do is uh, we'll stream it via cornerband.com. I uh, hadn't seen the cornerband guys. I know they were having a little bit of a bad time. But it'll be streamed via cornerband.com. And then a week later, uh, Steve Gibson's File Shack will have it for download. So, and then we'll also have DVDs available to buy for people that do not have broadband. So we should make this workshop accessible to everybody that wants to see it one way or another, okay? The guys with the prizes over here, all the way to the left, we tallied them up using uh, one of the pricing engines and uh, came up to right around $20,000 worth of goods. So. Everybody else that's involved here, what they've done is they've ponied up prizes and they were asked for their participation. Hey, we're going to be, we want to give a lot of this stuff back to the community and what do you want to give? So these guys over here are the guys who made it happen and I'm going to run down, we were supposed to have banners hanging for these guys and we ran into a couple of issues with hanging banners in this room. Uh, so the merchandise we have, and of course we'll be going over this again, from ABIT, AMD, ATI, Best Buy, and I had to make a, a couple of notes on the Best Buy thing here. Best Buy ponied up over $3,000 in gift cards. I left them at home. So, well, it, it's, you're still getting a good shot, okay? So what we'll do is we'll run a contest off the webpage for that. So, uh, so we'll, give, we'll give the guys that, uh, that couldn't show up a chance to win something as well. Uh, BFG Technologies, these are the guys over here in the black t-shirts. Uh, so if you want to beat on them about anything, go over there. That's Shane Vance and John Malley, two of the names you might have to be familiar with with them. And uh, go over there and you can beat those guys up and ask them about new things that are coming down the pike. Directron is here. Is, how many of y'all familiar with Directron.com? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They've got some new cases over here they're showing off. And you actually really have to see this. It's really cool the way they, they paint these cases now. I really like the wood ones, but check out some of the cases that are over here. They've got five cases, plain cases are over here giving away. Gainworks ponied up cards. We have GameWise.com, which is a local land gaming center uh, in Plano. It's giving away some things. Hercules, they have given us 20 of their uh, Game Theater XPs to give away to you guys. Intel has uh, ponied up a couple of processors as boards as well. Kingston is here with their, some of their new memory. Uh, MSI has some five really nice combos to give away. The guys at, uh, that make Nanotherm heat sink paste, giving away some of that as well. Uh, NVIDIA is here and they've uh, helped us with five chain tech combinations that will be given away with AMD 2600 processors. Uh, Tyan has ponied up some of their new uh, video cards. They're the 9000 series over there on the end. Uh, Vantech has sent in multiple, they're doing a lot of stuff now. I don't remember what they sent. Uh, Via here as well with uh, board combos. Yamaha with CD burners. ID Software has ponied up some games for us, and Corsair sent five sets of uh, matched PC3500 memory. So that's, uh, that's all the guys who are actually making this happen. Okay, now I know I'm already sitting up here yapping way too long, and you guys want to hear about some hardware. I'm going to ask Anand to come up, and we're going to start out talking about CPUs, and you know we do this in a pretty informal fashion. So as, uh, as he talks through this, uh, if you've got any questions, raise your hand, wait to be recognized, ask your question in a clear, concise manner if you hadn't drank a half bottle of Jim Beam before you got here, <laughs> and then we'll try to answer it for you, okay? Anon. There's no real format here, so just ask the way I can handle CPUs. 
but if there's something else you're really interested in, I'll touch on it. Kyle's going to do a lot of other things too, but it's really up to you guys. So stick a hand up if you have a question, and we'll do the best to answer them. <laughs> well, I guess let's start out this way. Is there anything you guys would like to talk about first? <laughs> I know you guys have a question. Hammer. Okay, what do you want to know about Hammer? And this is the perfect time to talk about it. We've got AMD here. Um, I'm actually heading out to Fab 30 in Dresden in a couple weeks to talk about Hammer and see where it's being made. Uh, but what kind of questions do we have? We've got a question over here in the black. Yeah, the Hammer chip has the memory Pro, uh, memory controller built onto the chip. How's that going to change? Are you going to have to get a new chip when you go to, from DDR to DDR2 or whatever comes down the pipe? Or are you just going to do another board or board end chip? Or how's that going to work? So the question is, one of the major features of Hammer is this on-dime memory controller. And the question is, what does this mean for when you're changing from, say, DDR333 to DDR400 or from DDR to DDR2? And it's a good question. I actually asked this, uh, to, I actually posed this question to AMD at Comdex. And the answer is, unfortunately, if you want to go from, say, DDR333 to DDR400, you actually need a new chip. So uh, if, if you want official support for DDR400, you'll need a new chip. Now, since I know a lot of you here are overclockers, you, you don't really play things by the book, in theory, you should be able to overclock a hammer that supports DDR333 to include DDR400 support. Simply because it's, it's identical memory technology, identical architecture, the only thing that's changing is the clock frequency that's running out. So in theory, you should be able to do that, but obviously when push comes to shove, it depends on uh, the chip itself, the chipsets, the motherboards, things like that. Now, in order to support DDR2 support, um, that's going to be a bit more difficult since there's actually a fundamental change in the way the memory works. So you're not going to be able to just uh, set something in the BIOS and have DDR2 support. That will require a completely new chip and a new board design. But good question. Uh, next right here. What about the heat issues? Heat issues with hammer, that's actually pretty interesting. Because of AMD's silicon insulator technology, hammer should actually be a very, very cool running chip. And uh, for the way silicon insulator works, I'm not going to get too technical here, but in the end, it's just more efficient use of the, the silicon that's there. It's more efficient use of the current that's there, and it's making sure you reduce things like leak churn and other things that would contribute to a chip that's more inefficient when it comes to power. So hammer should actually be much, much better than anything out, uh, both from AMD and Intel at the time. Go for it. What do you see as the biggest uh, advantages of multi-thread processing that we'll see? The, the question is what the biggest advantage for multi-threaded processors? Right. So multi-threading, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm assuming you're trying to go towards the, the hyper-threading angle here versus the way these going. Okay. So there's this idea of running multiple threads of an application at, at the same time, either one application or multiple applications. Um, I think it does have a lot of potential because if you look at the way CPU or computer usage has worked and has evolved over the past two decades, for example, it went from doing one specific task and, and really striving and struggling to that one specific task to do that as fast as possible to now we're getting really greedy, we're getting really demanding, and we're trying to do 50 billion things at once. And the question is, what processes do we need, what technology do we need to make sure that we can do that? and keep productivity up there, keep the, the, the ease of use up there, keep everything running as fast as possible. I think hyperthreading is an interesting solution to the problem. There's a lot that needs to happen for hyperthreading to really take off there. Uh, the, for example, games right now, hyperthreading, the games and hyperthreading don't really do much because if you look at, uh, look at a game, look at game code, the only two things that are running in parallel in a game are basically sound and the game engine itself. And as most of you know, as we all know, the sound code, sound processing doesn't take all that much time in games. And the rest is done in this other thread, which is just entirely for the game engine. So I wouldn't expect to see multi-threading really do much for games for quite some time. You know, it has done some stuff with that, and John Carmack's really pushing it. But overall, for the gaming industry, I don't see hyper-threading, multi-threading really having an impact there. I think, obviously, servers makes the most sense, since servers are inherently a very th threaded environment. You have an environment where you have thousands upon thousands of people concurrently accessing a set a uh, number of resources, and those resources are obviously more tailored towards uh, hyperthreading or something like that. Better? Yeah. Can you all hear me out there? There you go. Alright. So servers, obviously, that's going to continue to use hyperthreading, that's going to continue to use multi-threaded environments. That's one of the reasons AMD is going, AMD is going so far into this idea of going for a very cheap, very easy to implement multi-processing architecture with Hammer. If you look at how easy it is to build a 4-way, an 8-way, 16-way plus Hammer setup, uh, compared to conventional SMP architectures, it's, it's much more simple, much more geared towards throwing as many processors in there as possible, much more geared towards the server market. 
Um, for the overall desktop, for the power users, for you guys, you can look at multi-threading, look at hyper-threading, look at multi-processing as things that are enable you, going to enable you to run much more concurrently than you do now. Think about it this way. Right now in Word, you have OK grammar check working in the background, OK spell check. But in the future, what you'll be able to do with all the CPU power, all these CPUs, all these ability, the ability to run multiple threads at the same time on one CPU or across multiple CPUs, you'll be able to do things like voice recognition while you're working on Word. You'll be able to have grammar check maybe in different languages. A lot, a lot of things like that can be made possible by the ability to execute things in parallel, multiple threads in parallel. So I think it's, it's a direction that both AMD and Intel are going for. It's uh, different approaches. Intel's going for hyper-threading now, and with, with the thought of that, that helping out much later on with uh, changes in compilers, changes in the way people write programs. AMD, I think, on the other hand, is basically making a very affordable SMP platform with Hammer uh, because of its, its uh, on diagonal bridge. So hopefully that was a bit verbose, but hopefully that answered your question. Over here. So the question is, if you compile or optimize an application for hyper-threading, will that essentially screw over an AMD system running that, or will that, will that, you know, how, how will that work if you have a multiprocessor, a single processor AMD system, Hammer, Anthon, whatever? Very good question. The beauty of the way hyper-threading works, and one of the reasons why it's, it's not really going to compete against AMD, but it, it, it actually helps everyone move forward, is that when you optimize for hyper-threading, you're actually optimizing for multiprocessing. Because all you're doing is you're making sure that instead of one thread per application, uh, you're, you're having multiple threads dispatched per application. So it'll, it'll perform just as well, or you know, it'll perform just as well as any other application would on an AMD platform. And if you go to a multiprocessor AMD platform, you'll also get, you'll get uh, at least the same benefit as a hyper CPU would. So it's, it's, it's nothing fancy that's specific to Intel CPUs, it's just, it'll work on anything basically. Question back here. So the question is, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. You're asking uh, for multi-processor, uh, multi-threading with dual processors. Well, I mean, with all these new innovations, with the dimension that there's going to be a limit, and how fast you're going to be able to go, I'm wondering how high that's going to be. So the, the, the question was, basically, what, what are the limitations for CPU architecture? What are the limitations for CPU design? How fast can CPUs get? It's, it's a difficult question to answer because there are a number of factors you have to look into. Um, and I can touch on a couple of them. One of the main factors that, that actually limits how fast your CPUs can get, and something that's often overlooked, is packaging technology. And when I say packaging technology, I'm not talking about the silicon, I'm not talking about anything else. I'm talking about physically connecting the silicon to those 700 plus pins you see at the bottom of a hammer. Most people don't think about that as a major issue, but it is, if you think about it this way. The data can only get in and out of the CPU through those little pins. And those pins, those 700 plus pins, connect to a piece of silicon that's about this big. And how they make that connection, how they maintain power delivery, things like that are all key factors in determining whether or not, or what speeds the CPU will reach. So that's, that's one area where uh, both AMD and Intel are working uh, very diligently to improve uh, and kind of provide our innovation so we can be at whatever, 10 gigahertz by 2007. Uh, if you look at one of the things Intel has done is their bumpless build-up layer um, technology, which basically, <coughs> right now the, the, the packaging technology everyone's using is flip chip. Um, and I'm sure most of you guys have heard of that flip chip with a heat spread or something like that on top of it. That's what Hammer, well, that's what Hammer is using. Well, this build-up layer actually builds the silicon and uh, into the package itself. So what you end up having is a CPU that's the thickness of a credit card. There's no exposed core. The core is built into the package itself. Um, I, I, we posted pictures of it online. If you do a search for this build-up layer, you can get an idea for exactly what it is and what it looks like. But it's it's pretty neat technology. Things like that will help. Uh, increase CPU speeds. Obviously manufacturing improvements, things like silicon insulator, things like uh, double and tri-gate uh, transistors will also help increase speed. I think if you say what the limit is, uh, you know, way back when people said we'd never reach a gigahertz, people said we'd never reach 100 megahertz even. Uh, I think the limits will always be extended through things like innovation, through innovation in packaging technology and silicon production technology. Uh, you can't really define where a clock speed limit is because the point of this industry, the beauty of what we do and the, what we cover is that it always, always exceeds our expectations and it always evolves above and beyond what we're able to think and imagine. 
So there's a lot of cool stuff that's going on right now. Things like bubbles build up layer, um, transition to 90 nanometer technology. The, 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 the nanotechnology generation has just began to start, to start. And it's things like that that will really take us above and beyond where we are now. Question back here. Die size is always a limitation from a manufacturing perspective. Because, you, listen, you can make a CPU with a die size that's three inches by three inches. But the real question is, are you going to be able to make it profitably? And unfortunately, you know, the larger your die size gets, the, the more defects you have, the more issues you run into with uh, uh, being able to essentially make a chip that's profitable. I mean, we can't get ourselves here. Both AMD and Intel are this, in this to make money out of all of us. And they're not going to uh, put out a chip that doesn't essentially uh, doesn't balance the pros and cons of profits versus uh, performance. Um, die size is always an issue, but if you look at the things working against, uh, working for reducing die size, if you look at the transition to 90 nanometer, that essentially saves us 50% of die size. If you have a, a 0.13 micron chip and a 90 nanometer chip side by side, the 90 nanometer chip is going to be about 50% the size of the 0.13. So things like that will always help uh, reduce die size. And I think it's, it's an ongoing problem, it's a problem that everyone has to face, but it's a problem that is relatively easy to solve compared to some of the other issues. Power delivery is going to be a huge issue, packaging technology is going to be a huge issue. As these die sizes get smaller, as they, they, you have you know, close to a billion transistors and these little chips, removing heat from them is going to be a major, major concern. So I think those are more, uh, I guess, issues on the minds of everyone, uh, the, the chip designers, than necessarily die size. What exactly is electron migration and why do we need to worry about it? Electron migration and why we need to worry about it. Um, I think you're, you're asking from a chip set, uh, from a chip manufacturing perspective, I guess. Well, I'm talking about from overclocking. How, I mean, how much reduction in life are we going to get from raising voltage? That's that's something that I guess you can do. You can do a lot of studies on. If you look at the half lives of a lot of these CPUs, we're talking a decade or more or, or longer. Um, how much of a reduction in chip life are you going to get from overvolting your CPU? Rule of thumb, at least for me, if you go above 10 percent an increase in, in, in core voltage, then you start reducing the life of your CPU by a number of years. But if you look at it, how many of you guys keep your CPUs around for five years plus? Very few. You know, if you're anything like me, in six months they're gone. So, well, over that was the old days. I mean, the new chips are much more sensitive. Uh, they're not necessarily much more sensitive. Well, let, let's look at the way it works. Um, so, CPUs, computer architecture, everything like that works on a binary system, right? Things are either a one or a zero. And the way it works on the inside of a CPU is a 1 is equal to whatever core voltage is, say 1.75 volts. A 0 is equal to whatever, 0 volts. Once you start increasing the voltages, once you start messing around with the tolerances, making things much more easier uh, for you to overclock, you start screwing with where a 1 is and where a 0 is in the CPU. So now when, when a 1 is, I don't know, say 1.85 volts, there's a lot more noise on the signal. There's, there are a lot more uh, issues that you have to take into account. There are a lot more things like uh, what happens, if, how does the CPU know where, whether you're asking it for a 1 or a 0. Issues like that really come into play. That's what reduces stability and things like that. Um, in terms of, I mean, the original question was how much, essentially, how much are you damaging your CPU by overbolting it? I don't think you can quantify that. I don't think you can say if you increase it 15%, you're going to reduce 10 years off your CPU. I don't think you can really put it like that. Um, what, what you can do is basically say, you go, above, you go above a certain threshold, look at the tech docs, look at what Intel and AMD say is the maximum recommended voltage for the CPU. Above and beyond that is where you start reducing lifespan on your CPU. Um, again, like I said, my rule of thumb's always been 10%. You go above 10%, then you start to cut off life of your CPU. But if you're, if you're not keeping these things for, for years upon years, then it's not usually a big deal. But, like I said, it's, it's, it's usually up to you. It depends. You go above 10%, you go above 15, 25, 30%. Unless you're introducing super cooling or something like that to cancel out the effects of really increasing or decreasing tolerances of these CPUs, you're going to end up with, uh, with a CPU with a reduced lifespan. we got a question back here. <laughs> I'm a guy that, that, that likes whatever is uh, whatever's out there, whatever's interesting. What now? I have uh, probably about four or five different systems evenly split between Intel and AMD. <laughs> <laughs> Architecturally speaking, uh, looking at the way, the way the uh, current technology is going, who do you see reaching their architectural limits first? That's a very good question. The question is, who do I see Intel or AMD reaching their architectural limitations first? Um, let's take a look at, essentially, let's take a look at the next generation of competitors. 
Prescott from Intel, um, Hammer from AMD. Prescott from Intel, from what we've seen at least, is very much like the current generation of Pentium 4. Um, it's, a, it's a technology that was introduced you know, just not too long ago. Um, essentially has much more cache, uh, smaller die, things like that. The major feature Intel has going for them is hyper-threading. So it's really a question of whether or not Intel's betting on the right technology. If hyper-threading takes off, then Intel's essentially ahead of the game. If everyone in their model starts supporting hyper-threading, if all these applications have support for multi-threaded uh, CPUs, then Intel's ahead of the game. And they, they, I mean, that's what they're counting on, that's what they're banking on. AMD, on the other hand, is, isn't banking on that. They're not banking on that just yet. They're saying hyper-threading isn't going to take off right now. And if it does, hey, we'll include it. But we're not betting that that's the number one thing. AMD, on the other hand, is going for this, the idea of an on-dot memory controller. The on-dot memory controller actually makes a lot of sense because if you look at today's applications, if you look at today's usage patterns, an on-dot memory controller yields a much greater performance benefit than hyper-threading. Uh, just because the, the, the major issue right now is how quickly can you get data from memory to your CPU? You know, your CPU can be running at 15 billion gigahertz, but if your memory's still running at 266 megahertz, then it doesn't matter. Right? Your CPU is it's, it's the weakest link. Your CPU is still as fast as how fast it can get memory. So it really depends on where the application developers, where the software developers, where the industry as a whole sees things going. If there is the strong push towards multi-thread, then Intel's definitely, they've made the right bet, they're on the, the right track to, to getting there to having the best architecture. If it doesn't, however, if hyper threading doesn't take off, then AMD is obviously in a much better position. I think on day one, when the hammer releases, um, hyper threading isn't really going to have taken off all that much. So we'll probably see AMD ahead. Um, if we look at when they're going to reach the architectural limitations, I don't think the question is when we're going to see architectural limitations. I think when we're going to see manufacturing limitations is going to be the issue. You know, who can transition to 90 nanometer? Who can transition below 90 nanometer? Who can introduce things like uh, dual and tri-gate transistors? Things like that. Who has the best packaging technology? That's what dictates how fast you can get these CPUs. That's what dictates what limitations and when you're going to encounter them. So I think that's the question that we need to be asking. And unfortunately, that's not something you can benchmark. It's something that you just got to close your eyes and let the engineers know what they're doing. We've got time for one more question. All right, well, so who wants to ask it? Don't come up with something retarded, okay? <laughs> there's a lot of pressure on you asking the last question. Okay? Are you sure you can handle it? Yeah. You're there. Yeah. All right, uh, bringing your attention to multiple die CPUs, uh, would it be possible to integrate, say, a small memory chip into a CPU package? How much would that speed up the memory access? Man, that question sucked. <laughs> Yeah, that is a very good question. So the question is, it's actually twofold. The, the question is, multiple dies on one chip, and if you start talking about multiple cores on one chip, what about doing a piece of memory on chip? So let's talk about the memory issue first, because essentially integrating a piece of memory on chip, that's just like adding a cache. That's all cache is. So that's something that all manufacturers are doing, and it's something that, that the smaller the manufacturing processes get, the, the more transitions they can cram on there, the better their power delivery gets, we're going to have more cache. You look at Prescott, they do with a, a mega Hyundai L2 cache. Um, Hammer's going to have, eventually, uh, at least on the, on the server end, it's going to have something uh, comparable to that. Um, even in the mobile end, at the beginning of 2004, mobile and Prescott's going to have one mega Hyundai L2 cache. That's in a, that's in a mobile CPU. You know, this kind of stuff, we, we never thought of before, we never thought it was possible, but it is made possible. The issue of putting multiple cores on a single die is something that we've heard rumored from AMD, obviously, from other people as well. And this actually goes back to the packaging issue. If you remember back to Intel's Pentium Pro, um, they did a similar thing. They had, they were one of the first x86 CPUs, actually the first x86 CPU, to have uh, a very large on-die L2 cache. But it wasn't on-die. It was basically a piece of memory and a CPU on one package, two dies, one package. So it's a lot like this idea of having two CPUs on one package. Two separate dies, but one package. The problem is manufacturing. Because what Intel ran into with the Pentium Pro was, Hey, when, let's say there's a problem with the cache, or there's a problem with the CPU, you have to throw the entire CPU away. You can salvage one part or another. It was a major issue with manufacturing, and it's what ended up causing the, uh, the Pentium Pro to cost so much to make, one of the major reasons. So that's actually something that I really don't think is going to be too feasible. It might get done, it might be done, but I don't think from a cost, uh, from a cost standpoint, it's really going to be something that's too feasible for current flip chip packaging technologies. Something like BBUL, bubbles build-up layer, or comparable technologies, that's when I really think 
uh, two cores on Lipat makes a lot of sense. And that opens uh, a whole new avenue of opportunities. One of the ideas that I was talking to uh, um, one of Intel R&D guys about was this idea of having two CPUs on one die, and one would essentially be a, a very fast CPU for, for all your, your performance critical tasks. And the other would be a slower CPU for you know, things that don't necessarily matter, things that don't need to get done in the fastest way possible. What you end up happening, uh, what you end up having with that is one total CPU that actually produces less heat than if you were to, to have two very high-speed cores. So you think about it more. Clicking on the start menu doesn't require a four gigahertz menu for it. It doesn't require a three gigahertz hammer. Not the case. But offload things like that onto a slower CPU and keep your, your, fast CPU, your fast CPU for games, things like that. It's just an idea, but it's one of the, one of the things that multiple uh, cores on a single package does. But again, the primary limitation is packaging at this point. So that has to change, and that changes is a lot of opportunity. I won't take up any more of your time. I appreciate the questions. Uh, once again, thanks to Kyle and everyone else for coming out here and having me out here and supporting us. And uh, good luck, Kyle. Got into the shit, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he does. Okay, uh, we're going to go through the first round of some giveaway stuff here. What we have first to give away is an Intel desktop reference board. No, actually, no reference board. Intel desktop board, I845 PE. Does everybody have a ticket in their hand? Yes. Does everybody have a ticket? What we're going to give away with this is going to be a 2.6 gigahertz P4 for the combo. I requested a 100 megahertz frontside bus. These are actually Intel uh, engineering samples. So there's a very good chance you might get a pretty nice chip if they cull it real good this time for review samples. Let's, uh, let's, talk, about, let's talk about video cards. Um, there, there's been a pretty good bit of excitement in the, in the video card field here recently. And uh, watching what NVIDIA has been doing, or what NVIDIA hasn't been doing, we know they've been busy behind the scenes, of course, and uh, we're waiting for the GeForce uh, FX to come out. But outside of that, outside us being ready, which I think they've been asking us, we know we are, uh, there's, there's been little excitement there. Uh, they did their kickoff at Comdex this year, and you can see the demos running. Is the machine still? <laughs> the machine, you, you can come up and see the demos running. Some of the demos that, uh, that are running on the GeForce FX up here are, are absolutely incredible. It, it really is something to behold. It really is something to see. So uh, if you get a chance during the rest of the evening, come up here and uh, take a look at that. You definitely want to. Um, the other things going on definitely have been on the ATI side of the fence. Um, how many people here own an NVIDIA card? <laughs> Brian Burt says thank you. <laughs> how many, uh, how many of you guys uh, own ATI cards? <laughs> how many of you owned ATI cards last year? <laughs> how many own uh, Matrox? <laughs> you can get out right now. So we've seen, uh, we've seen what's going on with, uh, with ATI, and everybody's pretty impressed with what they brought to the table. Uh, their driver set's finally coming together where it can be usable by a, a normal human being to some extent. <laughs> it's a normal human being. Um, they've just come out with the, uh, how many of y'all own 9700s? How many of y'all own 9500s? Nobody did. I think uh, as, as far as on the enthusiast side of things, where uh, have y'all seen where the 9500 is clock locked? Yeah, we, uh, Brent, actually, where's Brent? Where's Brent? There's Brent. That's Brent Justice over there on the sidewall. He uh, writes a lot of our video uh, content. Standing next to him is, uh, yeah, give Brent a hand, man. He Standing next to him is Sean Pelletier, who just came to us from NB News. 
Net. He's going to start writing some content for us as well. Um, Steve couldn't make it. He wanted to be here. He's got uh, health issues and won't let him fly. But uh, so anyway, back to uh, Brent's been working on the, some of the 9500 uh, issues, going through it and finding out that, of course, the, the car is plot locked. Um, one of the guys that goes by the name of Warp 11 over in the Rage 3D forums uh, went through the hex code and found out how to unlock the 9500, but it requires a, a BIOS flash. And uh, so if you're looking to get a 9500, it's, it's definitely still a great card, and especially if you use any kind of anti-aliasing or any kind of anisotropic filtering, uh, the card came out exceptionally strong against the 4200 of NVIDIA and the 4600 of NVIDIA. And you're looking at a sub uh, $200 price point after probably $20 rebate schemes at Best Buy and things like that. Uh, well, I... <laughs> So any, any video card questions? What do you guys want to know? I've got, uh, wh whatever happened to the P10? Whatever happened to, what happened to the P10? I honestly don't know. <laughs> do, you, do you know? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I know I know has been working with those guys. They don't, they don't talk to me. So, so the P10 came out. Um, it was in some of their their Wildcat, the three lab stuff. But from a gaming standpoint, it's it's really not like it's not even on the map. It's it's just mainly for, for professional stuff. Even then, it's it's not all that competitive with uh, some of um, Nvidia's Quadro one. So it's it, it it was nice in theory. Creative Labs didn't jump on the ball as quickly as they should have. Um, it could have been good competition for Parhelia if they had actually gotten it out into the super end. But I think Creative Labs really dropped the ball on that, and I don't see it being any kind of success in the consumer market anytime soon. There you go. When is the API going to show some freaking Linux support? When is the API going to show some freaking Linux support? That's quote unquote. <laughs> I've asked the same questions of API, and their, their answer to me always is, we're diligently working on it. I can't quote him on that one, but they're diligently working on it. You know, until it shows up, it's, it's not there, and uh, I, I don't know. They've been, they've been really focused on all the DX9 stuff going on. The Catalyst 3.0 came out today or yesterday, we have an alert. So uh, maybe now that all that's behind, maybe we'll see them. Uh, I'll ask about that next week. We'll be on top of that. Questions? So about the NVIDIA on the Force FX and being fully direct to the X. What about the... Are you talking about the... He's asking is the GeForce FX going to be fully DX9 compliant? Are you talking about the question about the hardware displacement mapping? Yes. It's been a little bit. Here's my take on this. Uh, NVIDIA says that it is going to be fully the economic model. They generally don't like to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take their word of that. Until we see the, the car come about and see the drivers hit. Also, I don't see hardware displacement mapping being a real big issue. I don't, I don't think the game developers are really going to latch onto it and run with it in any, uh, in any big way. So even if it didn't have it, I don't think it's going to be an issue so much. But that's my personal opinion. Questions? Uh, what about OpenGL 2.0 support in the gaming market? What about OpenGL 3.0 support no, 2 in the gaming market? 2.0. 2 2.0. 2 2.0 in the gaming market, sorry. Edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think the support's going to be there. Uh, as long as you have John Carmack driving the gaming industry, and, and, I, and bottom line, that's it. They're, they're going to have to do it. They don't have any choice because uh, that man's going to keep designing the gaming engines that you know, 20% of the games in the market that are successful run on. So that's what that comes down to. Everybody's going to do what Carmack makes them do. <laughs>
has a strong 2D multi-monitor support and 3D gaming. What car, what video card are you running? Well, it's, it's like you have to have one, I do a lot of video rendering and a lot of uh, graphics applications, but if I want to do gaming, I need like another system or another video card for that. What video card are you running? <laughs> I've got an ATI 8500, but then I also have a Matrox. Uh, and you don't find that the 8500 fills your needs on the 2D side? The, the multi-monitor support's not as good as the Matrox, and it, it doesn't handle uh, like Premiere as well for video rendering. I'm using, I'm using a 9700 on my desktop for a multi-monitor setup right now. And I was running a 4600 before then. And I only have one computer. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll get a couple of them. But the one I use most of all. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've gone, I've gone to the, using the 9700 and I saw a tremendous difference in my desktop. I run 1940 by, by uh, 14, what, 1920 by 1440 resolution on my desktop. It's a 24 inch. <laughs> but, but still, even then, where, whereas, whereas I, I really couldn't see that, I really, I had a harder time running that with NVIDIA Guard. So I've seen a true difference in the latest ATI products that have come out. Okay, I really have seen, I've seen actually a quantum leap in some of their 2D quality. I mean, when I can sit, you know, seven foot back from the screen and, and read, I mean, it's, it's been, so I think maybe, maybe the, I think maybe the answer to your question is the generation of products already there that'll give you the quality that you're looking for. So, I mean, you know, maybe pick up a 9500 and check it out and see if it'll, if it'll you can go to Best Buy and you don't like them, take it back. <laughs> Questions? When can you actually buy a what? GeForce FX. A GeForce FX. February. February. You're looking, yeah, February or March is the, <laughs> the 60 day target window, big window. Monsters, that sort of thing, 
that you actually see that going on your screen, there'll be an interactive environment that you make you part of. So that's really the whole cinematic kind of, you're, you're going to live the movie instead of watching the movie. Kind of. Personal preference in video cards, I run a 9700 in my system right now. If I had to go out and buy a video card today, I'd buy a 9500. No doubt about it. This may order more on a memory question, but what do we see as far as the two differences between DDR2 memory that H guy look or excuse me, that NVIDIA is looking to use on their next on the Enforce FX versus um, ATI stand with traditional DDR? Uh, he's, asking, he's asking about next gen memory technologies and what we're going to see on these cards. You're, you're seeing, you're seeing uh, we're using DDR2 now, and we're using, we're using DDR1, and we're using Quad DDR, and we're using GDDR4, and uh, we're using this. Uh, basically, for the next memory architecture that we're going to see on the GeForce FX is, is simply it's DDR. Uh, do you guys know how bits of data on the rising and falling edges of a clock signal are transmitted? Okay. Basically, it's just like a little scoop that comes by and gets the data and takes it with it as this clock cycle goes by. <laughs> DDR2 is just putting a few more scoops on there. They're doubling up on the scoops coming by and get the data. So you're actually, you're not running necessarily a faster megahertz, but it's delivering twice as much data during the same cycle. So As far as watching uh, the, the new memory technologies and what's going to be used on the video cards, uh, well, see, right now, let, let's face it, we, we've all got these questions, but until we see the car show up and we can actually play with it in our hands, it's, uh, you know, what, what's it really going to bring to you? It's hard to say. Why did NVIDIA come out with 8x AGP for GeForce 4 if it's not any faster? Why did NVIDIA come out with 8x AGP for GeForce 4? seen the, the benchmark program we put together for Unreal Tournament? If you run the Phobos map on that, like 1600 by 1200 at 4AA turned on, if you go back and run that at 4X compared to 8X, you, you can really see some differences there. So as, as we see these larger textures start to be used in these games, you know, we're going to press on 80 megabyte textures, then um, you'll see 8X come into its own. But right now it really doesn't matter. It's just a marketing tool for everybody that's using it. And, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Something's, somebody's got to get with it. So. How well are the 9700s going to compete with the new GeForce FXs? I've had a couple of good sources on this, and from what we've seen firsthand, I would say that overall, and this is hard to quantify in one number, okay, but we'll do it anyway. I would say you're going to see a GeForce FX be approximately 25 to 35% faster than a current 9700 Pro. Price-wise, I don't know. Let's we'll see how it comes out, how it all washes out, when everything starts hitting the show. Mm -hmm. What do you see coming down the pipeline for uh, laptop 3D acceleration? What do I see coming down the pipeline for laptop 3D acceleration? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Redwood of Exta. That's the it's old the uh, Sean over there. Of, uh, remember what was it? it? Was Redwood's 3D news, man? I remember way back. Um, the the laptop end of it, I've, I've seen and. 
as a non mentioned, I've been really pushing this and I've been excited about this and seeing the new technologies that are coming out that are actually being used with the mobile equipment. Uh, right now, uh, my favorite that out there is, is built by ATI and it's built uh, basically on the, uh, the Radeon uh, 9000 core that we're seeing uh, in mobile units. And we're seeing it was, you're actually, they're just now coming to fruition. We're just now starting to see them for sale. There's only a couple of them out there in the marketplace on the Radeon Mobility 9000 is the actual name of the chip. If you want to go buy a laptop today and you actually expect a game on it, this is what you need to get. Okay, just no ifs, ands, buts about it. Uh, we've seen technology from NVIDIA that they were showing off at Comdex that blew me away. I mean, blew me away. They had what they've done. I mean, who's a fan of the NVIDIA TI-4200 in here? Yeah, I know there's a lot of you. Okay? But basically what they've done is they've taken the TI-4200 and made it a mobile product and put in some power saving features into it. And uh, it was, uh, the systems we saw running uh, was just like having a, a regular TI-4200 in a laptop. So we're about to see a quantum leap, but it's probably gonna be nine or 10 months, possibly a year before we really see that product on the shelf. But when that product does hit, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a big leap. I mean, it's a mobile gaming will, will really be there, no doubt about it. We need to wrap up, so who wants the last question? What other competition is there in terms of video uh, cards besides ATI and NVIDIA? Is there anybody else that's producing this what type of stuff? What other competition is there besides NVIDIA and ATI and video cards? Well, this, uh, this all comes down to you guys. You, you're the ones that create competition. Because if you don't buy it, there is no competition. I don't see, I don't see Matrox coming on. And we, we had some really great hopes for them for a while, but I, I don't see them doing anything. We keep hearing a few of these other companies come out with these, these technologies and you get a big news flash and it looks like the greatest thing since sliced bread and it ends up being nothing. Um, so, I mean, outside ATI and NVIDIA, who, who really is there? 3 Labs? What, what have they done for me lately? Nothing. Nothing. They haven't done anything. So until, you know, like I said, a, a press release and a good story about what's going on is all great and fine and dandy and, you know, gets everybody excited. But when it comes down to the, you know, it comes down to the wire, NVIDIA and ATR are the only ones putting meat in the table. So that's what we'll probably continue to buy. The second asylum card goes to 95558. <laughs> that's going to be uh, launched individually and it's going to be uh, of course based on this whole same uh, Castle Wolfenstein theme and the characters and all that but it's going to be a, uh, a squad based game where you go and clear roads and things and you actually give commands to your other squad leaders they were telling me about it the other night. I hadn't seen it but looking forward to it and I forgot the name of it. 95993 Here he goes. See, even the guys in the cheap seats win. I think we're going to hang off there. We got some AMD guys. Uh, they're going to talk to you for a second. Where are you? Good, I call. I forget your name. 
Mark. This is Mark with, uh, with AMD. Don't make fun of him because of his accent, okay? No, I get, I get women because of my accent, so... Thank you, Carl. Yeah, yeah, bro. So, we're getting lots of questions. We're going to uh, start when the pilot is done, and uh, we're going we're gonna to sign you all up, so make sure you stay here. Because uh, when Kyle is done giving away this, we're going to give away 60 processors. One review where it kind of had medium results. Have you had any others that you can tell us about? He's asking about the, the new dual channel brand bay boards we're seeing out there for uh, for pay for. And uh, kind of getting away from my first review, I, I've been I've been wanting the dual channel DDR so bad that I think I kind of built it up in my mind that I thought it was going to be something that's not. So I think I'm a little bit guilty on on kind of uh, having some over expectations for it. Um, if you go back and bench the boards, the dual, the V4, uh, take a 2.5 and 2.5, I mean, it's a, an I850 E board with PC1066 RAM design. Which one of you know RAM is? No. Okay. And then if you take a, uh, an Intel board with a Granite Bay chipset, you're going to find that the Granite Bay is, is basically neck and neck with, uh, with the, with the, with the fast RAM. Okay. What you have to understand about the Grand Bay board is the Grand Bay boards, the chipset itself is not being, it's not being handled as a retail desktop product. It is what uh, Intel classifies as a workstation product. And uh, well, we do have a lot of the manufacturers, the board manufacturers out there that are, that are using the chipset to build retail board. So, um, with that comes a premium. So you're going to see the Grand FA boards be slightly more expensive than, say, some of the i 45 PE boards or something that are out there. Okay? Uh, I was really just kind of cold by the Grand FA. Yes, it's, it's great architecture. Yes, it does some really great things. Uh, we had some flippant HEP issues that were kind of made us a little bit disappointed in it. And, uh, Right now, it's just really hard for me to say, hey, I think you need to go out there. If you're looking for an upgrade, you want to buy a Granite Bay board simply because it's got this, this slight edge over some of the other solutions that are out there. And then, of course, you look, you're paying $50 more for it as well than, than something that's back there. Now, I still think that the dual DDR is something to get incredibly excited over because what we're going to see Intel do, hopefully, the second half of next year or maybe even first quarter, with their launch is launch what's called their Springdale chipset. And their Springdale chipset has kind of morphed over the last 10 months from one thing into another. And what we're going to see now is it's going to be supporting dual channel DDR400, where the Granite Bay supports 266. So, you know, 400 has got to be better than 266, right? <laughs> of course. So we're going to see dual channel uh, uh, Springdale boards that are aimed at the retail desktop segment, and so there will not be such a premium on those chipsets at all. So mid next year, unless you just gotta have a, gotta have that upgrade right now, I would say hold off for the Springdale boards coming. Or on the Intel side, I would, uh, I would uh, suggest you do i45PE chipset. All the boards that we have tested with i45PEs 
have just been incredibly stable. They've been incredibly fast. They've just been all around good boards. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to say anything bad about it. How many of you guys are running Intel processors nowadays? <laughs> How many of you guys are running P4s? Okay, stick your hands up, man. I want to see this. Okay. I mean, you realize a year ago it would have been four of you. And y'all were paid by Andy, or paid by Andy. I know you were. So, so we're seeing we're seeing the enthusiast lane change change a tad bit. There's been some incredibly successful overclocks out there um, with the Pentium fours, and uh, it's, you know they're they're solid systems. So, I guess I kind of got a little bit verbose, as a non might say, on the on the answer. But there you go. Question. Seen, I was just what you thought. What's the, my thoughts on the ABIT AT7 Max 2? Okay, well, first of all, I gotta, I gotta, I've always loved ABIT boards, okay? So I'm, I'm biased against them, or for them, I know I am. I've just always really, really liked their products. Uh, when they make a bad product, we do tell you, okay? I mean, but that was, that was a great board. Definitely, if you're looking at buying a KT400 chipset, that's definitely one to look at, no doubt about it. KT400A, is it going to be worth it? I would say yes. Um, if it gets here, that's, that's another one of those, you know, well, will you deliver kind of things. Right? right now you've got basically KT400 out there, you've got Enforce 2 out there that's kind of coming into a level of maturity. Um, We've seen Enforce 2 boards for quite a while now. They've been problematic. Uh, they've been buggy. They have not been good products or anything we could suggest. We're finally starting to see some Enforce 2 boards now that seem to have some of those issues worked out. And it looks like a lot of it has been NVIDIA and their driver team working it out on their end. So we're starting to see a lot more stable products. Uh, Definitely the Enforce 2, if you utilize the Twinbeg dual channel DDR, uh, you're definitely looking at a much faster system. So, I mean, I, I still can't sit here and say you need to upgrade from KT400 to an Enforce system, but definitely if you're anything below KT333, then uh, I would definitely look at some of the Enforce reviews coming out. A non-tech does great reviews. You know, we do good reviews. We try to try our best to. Um, AMD and B does great reviews, uh, so definitely shop around. And I, I would I have to say this: never rely on one website for all your information. That goes for us included, because we, you know we get one or two samples, and so you know who, who knows? We might we might miss problems that uh, would occur with boards in a wide range we might not see. So always you know read up on, on four or five four uh, reviews before you actually purchase a board. Use the resources out there; they're free for all you guys. And, you know, you got guys out there willing to deliver good content. So just go with uh, the trust. Yeah, the Barton on the and the possibility of Enforce 2 supporting that when it happens with the BIOS updates or His whatever. His question is, he heard whispers of Barton having a 400 bus and the Enforce 2 chipset supporting it. When we're at Comdex, uh, a gentleman that runs a big company that starts the name NV actually said on stage that they had a part system running in the booth on a 400 bus system and an Enforce 2 chipset. So, so probably BIOS might be looking at it. Uh, <laughs> so I guess what I'm getting at, because I, I think I read that, and from my I understanding think, is, I, I think what BIOS updates is, take us there. I think what you're asking is, do AMD and NVIDIA have a relationship that they're really looking down the road at, at, at maturing one? And I think the answer to that question would be yes. I think they're working very, very close together. As you know, uh, Intel will not, well, Intel and NVIDIA can't come to terms on licensing uh, P4 chipset. So uh, definitely NVIDIA is doing a lot of things with AMD uh, to make sure that their chipsets have a market for them out there. And uh, the whole the force issue, and God, this is, I want to try to go through this quickly. NVIDIA is still just in their infancy 
when it comes to, to building chipsets. Maybe they build some of the best GPUs on the planet, and they know how the game works, and they know the politics behind the business, and they know how to get them on the shelves, and they know how to run them down your throat and make you go down there and buy $200 and put your car in the bag or not. Because <laughs> you've got to have it. But, on a, a chipset side or a main board, they're not quite as savvy, and they hadn't figured out the business quite as much. And uh, there's a lot of things that go on in Taiwan that they don't have control of. So they're, they're, they're still learning a lot from the business side, and how to interact with those people, and, and making their product come to life, and, and working through the problems. And to say that I think they've only been doing this really now for about a year, uh, I think they're doing a really good job at it now. And I think we'll see those relationships definitely uh, come to fruition in the future. So I, as long as NVIDIA keeps throwing the resources at their enforced line, which I think they are committed to, I, I think we're definitely going to see a product come that just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. There's just some challenges along the way that they have to, have to go around. What's the latest coming around the corner for the serial ATA drives? Because last time you've got a couple of dead ones. What's the latest coming around the corner on serial ATA drives? Uh, where's the Directron guys? What's the latest on serial ATA, Chris? Uh, we're, on, we're on back order. Apparently they've hit Japan uh, probably a month, two months, that's the rumor. Uh, our purchasing department is not as cool as some other purchasing departments, but pretty quick. Pretty quick. I know, I know there's been a lot of uh, uh, C8s come out a couple times and say, hey, serial ATA is next week. And they go, no, serial ATA is not. Kind of like Microsoft. Uh, serial ATA is uh, Trey, where's Trey? This is Trey Schumann, he came around some of our main order piece for us. And he's been doing a lot of subsystem testing. And uh, have you seen the, you've seen the, the, the ADIS serial L drive where you can take a uh, ADA drive and plug into the, the serial ATA port? And he's seeing uh, some advantages from CPU usage side. I don't think you, you saw actually some data so actually better data numbers, and all around, all around better numbers from using that system. That way you think about it, you still got the same, the same drive plug in. But, uh, so, serial ATA is going to be here, there's no doubt about it, when it's going to be here. You know, we keep hearing it's next week, and we keep hearing it's next week, and we keep hearing it's next week, and it's next week, and so one of those goes back and who knows. Uh, I would think Q1 and O3 would be definitely for sure. But, who knows. What do I think of the SIS chipsets? Um, I, I, we, we tested a lot of the, of the SIS products, and uh, the numbers are okay. They put together some stable things. They finally got a lot of their AGP drivers worked out, where, where the boards are actually good for gaming in the last year. And uh, I think SIS has been poised to do some, some really great things because they're coming out with some really strong memory controllers. SIS is coming out with a 655 chipset, which is going to be a support dual DDR333 for the Pentium 4, and also support for the overclockers out there, support to give you a choice to run it up to dual DDR400 as well. So, uh, but we hadn't seen any samples that board, and we're supposed to have samples by now. So, while well, it was something to get excited about, it was one of those things that hadn't shown up yet, at least not for us. But, yeah, they, SIS products, I mean, especially. You know, the way SIS uh, handles their business, whereas they don't uh, have to farm out, those, they actually make their own chipsets. They actually engineer them and actually make them and actually sell them. So they, uh, there's a level of profit in there that they don't have to give away. So you'll see a lot of the SIS chipsets on a lot of the economy boards are coming in at $70, you know, $80 each. So uh, I think they've got some really strong P4 chipsets. Their AMD chipsets I hadn't been so, so thrilled about. I still say go to Via or uh, NVIDIA on that. Now, I want, I want to talk to y'all about memory for, for a bit, real quick. Woo! Yeah. 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 <laughs> this, is a, this is Corsair PC3500, two match sticks that have been tested together. So we're going to give five sets of these away for uh, you guys in dual DDR settings. These are actually dated and signed by the owner of Corsair with a little hologram sticker on it. Yes, yeah. 
The date is 12-18-02. Yeah, that was Wednesday. <laughs> so what'd you score on SATs? <laughs> I've, been, I've been a real big proponent of Corsair for the last year, actually the last couple of years. And I've seen a, I've seen a lot of guys come and go and, in the in the DDR market, and I've seen a bunch of shoddy operations uh, that I don't necessarily uh, appreciate the way they treat a lot of you guys out there. And that uh, you know they send one thing to the reviewers, and you read one thing about it, and the product that we see showing up in, in the customers' hands, and in the hand, and in our hands when we order it, is not a, is not the same product that we read about. Okay. I've been, I've been a real big proponent of Corsair. They've done a tremendous job of doing high performance uh, DDR in the last couple of years and they basically own the marketplace when it, when it came to, to giving a consistent product out there that you could trust and get great support on time and time again. They got a bit of a premium of it, but uh, there's a lot of other solutions out there that uh, I simply won't even, I wouldn't even begin to suggest even for people on a budget. Uh, with that said, everybody here is probably aware of Kingston, huh? Kingston has introduced what they're calling uh, their HyperX series of uh, DDR. And basically, and it's, an, it's an, enthusi an enthusiast DDR that meets up with aggressive timings. And so Kingston now, we've got a bunch of busy boy as well, is doing PC 3500, okay? We're the overclocking. And what we are actually finding, and this has been through just a, a few of the samples we've gotten, we found the Kingston to outperform the Corsair when it comes to, to memory timings and being able to, say, run those aggressive timings at DDR 420 speeds at a lower voltage. We're finding we can do the same thing with the, with the, uh, with the Kingston at lower voltages. And of course, you know, lower voltage is better than our stability. Uh, so any, me any memory questions? I'm sorry. What package type is a memory? It's TSOP. Yes, it is. It's not VGA. Questions? What's the word on quad data rate? What's the word on quad data rate? It's, it's, it's a ways off, man. I mean, it, yeah. It ain't, it's not coming up quite yet. Uh, interesting thing on the memory front, I really thought we were going to see JEDEC not come out and sign off on and spend the time to spec DDR 400. And then we saw Intel Springdale chipset make a couple of uh, leaps from 333 then to DDR 400. And now I think you're going to see JEDEC is going to be uh, going over DDR 400 with a fine tooth comb. So I think Intel kind of has steered the market in another way there. So I think you're going to see a lot more emphasis on DDR 400 at this time. Will DDR400 you buy now be compatible with JEDEC spec? Well, yeah, you have to understand that there's no spec on this RAM. So to say that once, and the JEDEC400 spec I don't think has become official. So to be able to say that it meets spec, uh, there's no way to know that. Will you be able to use it together? I, I don't know. I honestly, honestly don't know. I, I, you know, RAM compatibility has been been really screwy ever since it started getting really fast for a while now. And uh, I mean, we always suggest at least going with the same manufacturer. Uh, does that mean you can't mix sticks? No, man. You know, we still see it happen every day and work just fine on some boards and, and not fine on others. I want to thank my wife, Suzanne Bennett, for. for allowing me to work 18 hours a day, seven days a week to keep up with all this crap. And I want to thank my parents that are right here as well. And I'd like to thank Anand and Matthew for coming as well because I think it really made a community event. And last but not least, and we still got the, don't run away, okay? I want to thank all you guys for showing up. Yeah. Yeah, I, I am absolutely just blown away, man. And I was just in no way expecting that, that kind of crowd. I really wasn't. So uh, thanks for being here. Remember all the sponsors when you go out to buy more crap, okay?
Thank you.